How many car can you see? Two car. So must put what? Yes, correct. Um, Nurul Nasiha is too young to really understand what's going on. She knows she was starting primary school and she knows it came to an abrupt end. Now her classroom is home and her parents, her teachers. Oh, well done. On the first day of the school year, Nurul was one of four six-year-old girls who defied the law and came to school in their Muslim headscarves. My daughter, education is as important as my faith, my religion. Education, you cannot separate from faith. It might not seem like a radical thing to do, but this was the most potent act of civil disobedience that Singapore has seen in years. On their third day at school, in full view of the media, all four girls were suspended. Bordered by two enormous Muslim nations, Indonesia and Malaysia, Singapore is a prosperous modern city-state with well-run institutions and an excellent education system. Its population is majority Chinese, with large Indian and European communities, and about 15% ethnic Malay, a sizable Muslim minority. In 1964, race riots between Chinese and ethnic Malays led to Singapore's separation from Malaya. And since independence, ethnic and religious tension has been contained through strict laws and social engineering. Religious symbols like the headscarf or tudung have been forbidden in schools for many years. The schools represent a precious common space uh, where all young Singaporeans uh, wear school uniforms as a, as a daily reminder of the need to stand together as citizens, um, regardless of race, religion and social status. The standard government line is that allowing the girls to wear their tudung would threaten Singapore's racial harmony. Allowing exceptions to this rule would fragment our community, our society, because it would fragment the common space that we have in school and invite competing demands from other communities to assert their own identities. Nurul's father, Nasser, cannot accept that his simple demand would jeopardize Singapore's racial balance. For him, it's a question of modesty. The problem is that when they grow up, you don't discipline them from small, and they, they don't uh, practice uh, what they're being taught in terms of religion. When they grow up, most are, I'm not saying all of them, I'm saying uh, maybe high percentage of them actually, when they, they become wayward, uh, uh, they start uh, intermingling with boys without any barrier, and, and then uh, some of them, you know, you can see the bus stop smoking, all this kind of thing. I'm just uh, disciplining her when she's still small so that I can have the assurance that when she grew up, when she grows up, she can become a modest person. Fawisa was another of the four suspended girls. She has a younger brother who goes to kindergarten and an older brother at primary school. Now she stays at home and watches her friends go without her. Do you miss your friends from school? Huh? Yes. yes. Yeah. They are all waiting for their school bus to come. For the first three days, she walked to school with her older brother, Mohammed. But now he goes alone. For rather uh, getting ready, she will make a sour face. <laughs> she will. She will make Why? a sour face. Huh? Why do you think? She cannot go to school. Be mm. surprised. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Especially in the first few days when she is suspended. Yeah. Uh, I am still looking for you. The kind of school that will give you a chance to study and uh, with your tudung on. I will still try, okay? Okay. 
the thing we have to remember is that as far as uh, Islam is concerned, there is no requirement for children of such a young age to don the, the headscarf. And the whole uh, question of whether um, the hair needs to be covered um, for even uh, post-pubescent uh, uh, girls uh, is also up for discussion. But assuming it is, uh, it certainly does not apply to, to young girls. And I, I don't think it's fair for parents to make that choice for... It's not fair for the children for parents to make that choice on their behalf. Zulkifli bin Ali never had a problem with his daughter attending primary school without a headscarf. But when she reached puberty three years ago, he felt he had no choice but to quietly withdraw her if she couldn't wear her tudung. You don't see your old fresh now? Do they feel sorry for you? Or? Yeah, because I was very friendly and they all, my whole class missed me. Mm -hmm. My teachers, yeah. You know, she had good friends. They were in from primary school. They were together. Then they went on to secondary school. Um, they were just like uh, uh, very close with each other. And suddenly, all this just disappeared. And now her friends had finished their education, their secondary education, and she's still doing her uh, O levels this year. You know, of course, there's some kind of like uh, uh, disappointment that uh, things cannot happen uh, the way we wish to. to but telling my friends I have to leave and uh, everyone started all crying on that. And my principal, um, she called my mom and asked her to let me attend school but then without the tutor, my mom said, no, we can't. Did you, ever, did you ever think to yourself, oh, let's, let's just forget the tutor and continue? 16-year-old Sheila and her 14-year-old sister, Sara, now attend classes at an adult education night school. Their classmates are mostly high school dropouts. It's an unsatisfactory compromise for a father who places a lot of emphasis on his daughter's education. I want her to be the best as she, as she possibly can. You know, I want the opportunities given to her like everybody else. If she wants to be a doctor, I want her to be given the opportunity to be, to be developed as a doctor, a good doctor, that I might add. You know, so I just want her to be normal, and I don't want her to be feel like being singled out because you are a practicing Muslim, <laughs> you, you are not deserving to be a Singaporean. All other opportunities are being closed. I think this is not, not fair. <laughs> Zulkifli was born Peter Wong. His Chinese parents converted the family to Islam when he was eight years old. A highly regarded telecommunications engineer, Zulkifli has three daughters and two sons. And they know that their sisters are being discriminated against and I always tell them, when you grow up, when you make big money, you make sure that uh, you take care of your sister, you know, because she doesn't have the opportunities that, that you have. This issue is not about hate scuffs. This issue is not about politics. It's not even really about religion. This is about respect. Yeah, this is about respecting the values of others. Zulfikar Mohammad Sharif is Singapore's most prominent Islamic activist. He runs a website, fateha.com, where Singapore's Muslims log on to discuss issues important to them. On the site, Zulfikar has taken up the parents' cause with a passion. One, we are doing it for the children. Two, we are also doing it for the parents. Um, even though it is compulsory on the girls to put on the headscarf only after puberty, it is compulsory on their parents to teach and train the girls to put on the headscarf before they reach puberty. Zulfikar has convinced the parents to take their protest one step further to mount a legal challenge to the government's ban on headscarves at school. This will be the first time in Singapore's history that civilians have taken the government to court. Well, I, I feel strongly that uh, that prohibition 
you know, is not lawful, as I said earlier, you know, impinges on freedom of religion, and uh, at the very least, it is discriminatory. High-profile Malaysian lawyer Karpal Singh has been enlisted to represent the families. Singh, who practices here at the High Court in Kuala Lumpur, is one of Asia's best-known lawyers. He says Singapore cannot use secular education to justify discrimination. The Singapore Constitution does provide for freedom of religion and outlaws discrimination. And these matters have been, for example, tested in England in the case of a Sikh schoolboy you know, who was in a private school and there was a directive that he could not put on a turban. He would only be admitted if he uh, removed his uh, turban and cut his hair, which he was uh, you know, prohibited by his religion to do so. And the matter went right up to the House of Lords. And the House of Lords held that uh, that directive was void. Singaporeans resent Malaysian interference in their internal affairs. And it's still unclear whether the Singaporean government will grant Singh permission to act on the family's behalf. You can expect that people who are not specifically related to the issues uh, join the fray and uh, express support to the parents, probably for their own interests and uh, not really for the interests of the four parents or the four children or the Singapore's, Singaporeans in general. In my personal view, I think it is really uh, unwelcome. Uh, every country, every sovereign country should have its right to manage its own affairs. But Malaysians feel justified passing judgment on what happens in their former territory. And the Tudung controversy is central to the continuing debate over Malay identity. You can't run away from the fact that historically, geographically, Singapore and Malaysia are still one. On either side, you know, people have relatives. And what happens in Singapore cannot be ignored by Malaysia. And what happens in Malaysia can't be uh, ignored by Singaporeans either. I think that it, uh, the, the, uh, their lives, you know, lives of Singaporeans and Malaysians are so intertwined. Karpal Singh is not the only Malaysian with an interest in this case. The interracial mixture of Malaysia is almost the same in Singapore. And whatever happens in Singapore is very much of concern to us. Uh, the Singapore government... It was Zulfikar who talked Karpal Singh into representing the families. And now he's briefing these Islamic activists from Malaysia. The fear of the losing control uh, is probably one of their biggest fears. Even what they're doing right now is against their own constitution. Obviously, Article 15.2 of the Constitution says that every individual has the right to profess and practice his religion and to propagate it. I think when the Malaysians get involved, it is, uh, it is generally for the sake of winning points uh, at home. Um, and I think what the Malay Muslim community has to learn in Singapore is that if they want to raise matters with the government, with the Singapore government, and they want certain um, matters to be resolved, they ought to deal um, with the government um, in a manner that's, that does not uh, politicize the matter and does not involve uh, outsiders. When Zulkifli bin Ali withdrew his daughters from school three years ago, he did so without making a fuss. It's only recently he's become bold enough to directly challenge the government's policy. Now he's joined the other parents in their legal action against the government. It is not uh, a religious issue. We are going to court uh, uh, more of uh, demanding our constitutional rights be restored. All right? Uh, firstly, is that um, we are ho hopeful that um, that uh, by by going to court that uh, this archaic policy will be repealed. She's missed out on uh, good education because uh, um, everybody else in Singapore, Singaporeans uh, who goes to um, the education process, you know, if you if you are smart, you go to the good school, and in good schools they teach you. Uh, uh, advanced Malay or higher Malay, or they call them, uh, AMATs. Well, you go, she, does, she doesn't have that. Uh, now she's, she's out uh, in a uh, 
a, an adult education, well, she does have English, math, and science, but it's like the normal math, not the advanced math, like what I did in school. You know, she doesn't have the opportunities that I have. You know, that's very sad. The government points out that most of Singapore's Muslims are happy to compromise and says these families do not represent a mainstream view. I think they should listen to the advice of the Mufti of Singapore who said that if there is a question of choice between the education, which is very important in Islam, and the need to cover the head with the headscarf, then education should be given priority. In all of this, there had been very little discussion on the children themselves, uh, what the children had been going through, the, the, the children who were suspended from school. These young children, these young kids, um, had just started school this, this January. Um, and kids of their age are very excited about going to, to primary one for the first time, to primary school for the first time, and now they don't have that opportunity. Uh, and I think that is very sad, and I think it's sad that um, the parents have to put their children in such uh, a situation. The parents seem to be concerned with their own battle against the government. Uh, the government, uh, the government uh, has been concerned with uh, perceptions of the other communities, with uh, inter-ethnic relations, which is all fine. But uh, what I find sad is that you know the children are going through uh, difficult times. Zulkifli's youngest daughter, Khadija, has all of this ahead of her. She's just three years old, and her father hopes that by the time she starts school, she'll be allowed to wear her tudung. <laughs>